Thanks. All right, well, welcome to this electrical for mechanicals, or electricity for mechanicals. The name was kind of a <clears throat> collaborative idea. <laughs> but um, the intent here today is to uh, Okay, so uh, the intent is to talk about some basic electricity stuff. Um, I'm going to get into some theory. Maybe you've seen it, maybe you've not, depending on your background in school and what you remember from school. Um, talk about what basic electricity is, how it acts, that's key, and it will build up to a point where eventually we'll get to talking about theory and ending with the short circuit topic, one of the hot topics in the industry today. Uh, that we are all concerned about, have to deal with, both from engineers, from contractors, from manufacturers, from AHJs, and all that. So first, I'm a partner in Ring and Do. I'm an electrical engineer. Um, I graduated at MSOE in 94. So yeah, I'm kind of old, been around the block. Um, my main uh, market sectors have been commercial. DFD, uh, for people out of state, that's the Department of Administration, State of Wisconsin. Um, higher education in that. Um, science, tech, that kind of stuff. That's kind of where I live the most. Part. Um, so concepts, starting with the basics, basics. We're not going to the quantum level for electrical and what particles are. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but the Coulomb, it's a bunch of electrons. 6.25 times 10 to the 18 electrons. I'm trying to equate this to mechanical stuff. So think of it as like water, like a gallon of water. It's a gallon of electricity or something like that. So that's what we're talking about on a basic level, a negatively charged particle, which is an electron. We talk about the current of a uh, system. It's equal to a water flow, if you want to look at that. So this diagram on the bottom, it's a pretty good diagram. So you have a pump, you have 10 PSI, you have 20 gallons per minute, and you have the water wheel, you have the machine. Um, on the electrical side, you have the generator, 120 volts, 16 amps, and then you have a horsepower motor. It's a similar phenomenon. It's kind of amazing how similar electricity is to water. With the primary difference is that if you take a look at a receptacle on the wall or whatever, you walk up to it and you touch it, you're not going to get zapped unless you stick your finger in it. You know, I mean, some of our more adventurous children used to do that with paper clips. We weren't smart. We survived. But, you know, you learn quickly not to do that. What happens when you leave a water hose bib open? Water comes out, right? Electricity doesn't do that. The key point about electricity is that it's drawn. You have to use electricity for electricity to flow. That's one of the key points. So we get the amps. It's just one measurement of one coulomb per second passing a point. Um, so that's how we relate electrons. So we talk about voltage. Voltage is equal to pressure in a system. What is the pressure of the water in the pipe? You guys can relate to that. I talk about voltage, is it 120 volts, is it 480 volts, is it 277, we go into Europe, it's 380, 384, whatever. The same concept, the physical uh, parameter. Another one is ohms or resistance or resistance to flow is basically the, the basic point. Um, in electrical systems, we have wires. You know, we, we have a wire going in and we have a wire going back. That's a little bit different than water, where the water just kind of spits out or the air just spits out. But again, electricity does not flow unless you have resistance in the circuit. So we take a look at pressure reducers or rough pipe, it's about the same thing. And in the electrical world, and this is getting very unscientific, but it's basically the electrons running into the molecules of the wire. I know like some physicists are probably like, oh, that's not exactly right. That's the basic concept. So basically, if you want to run full speed through a crowd of people, you're going to bonk into people, right? If you actually have people spaced further apart or people aren't moving, you're going to be able to get through them. Not to get too far down the rabbit hole, but that's the basic concept behind such things as superconductors. When you cool down the conductors, you're basically cooling down the molecules so they're not vibrating. So you can actually wiggle through and it reduces the resistance. Now, in a building, we don't superconduct anything. I mean, like normal building that we work on. We're not like putting, you know, conductors in liquid nitrogen and doing that kind of stuff. But that's the concept of how we reduce resistance. All of these are key when we get to short circuit and such like that. And the concept behind this 
is voltage drop, pressure drop, water drop. You know, I, I learned uh, when I was a little bit more naive that you can't actually hook up four, you know, take one hose bib, um, hook up like those four splitter hose bib thingies and run a hundred feet of, uh, uh, you know, to uh, 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 a pipe, a uh, hose to sprinklers. You know, they all kind of, went, you know, that type of thing. Same exact concept, we'll get into that, the Kirchhoff's current law. So, and we talk about resistance here. What we get, and this is the key point, when we run electricity through a wire, we get two things. We get heat and electromagnetic field, specifically out of AC. The AC doesn't do that. When you run AC electricity, the magnetic field is an important part. <clears throat> heat coming out of electrical wires, we all know about that. There's this little thing called a light bulb, the Edison light bulb, the old incandescent ones. Those things glow, right? Have you ever touched a hot light bulb, right? Reason it's hot is because it's basically a resistor. It blows, it wastes, I don't know, it's like 80 or 90% of electricity going through it. You know, kind of waste. It's really inefficient compared to like fluorescent LED. But the basic concept is it's glowing red hot, and that's the light we see. So that's the basic concept. Um, you know, the, the, the thing when we talk about the current uh, going through the field, we'll talk about inductors, it rotates. And that's important as well because there's a rotation to it. So um, we talk about Ohm's law. Now we're getting into the formulas. This is the basic thing. You'll see this all over. Contractors kind of keep this in their pockets and such. Um, v equals IR. The voltage equals current times resistance. Another version of that is P equals IV. You can do der derivations and blah, blah, blah. Get into P equals IV. V equals IR is important because voltage equals current times resistance. Any one of those is missing, it's zero. So if we have voltage at 120 in an outlet and we have no resistance, we're not going to have any current. That's the, you got to plug something in to get something out of it, which is different than water. Um, but the thing is, is in buildings, we don't use resistance. As a design engineer, as an application engineer, no electrical engineer will actually use resistance. So it's not like, hey, what's the resistance on your air handling unit? No, no. We say, you know, what's the horsepower on your air handling unit, that type of thing. So what do we care about? We take the power equals current times voltage. It's just a derivation. Again, you can go through it and look it up online. So power is what we care about and current and voltage. Again, any one of those, you don't have anything. It sounds obvious, but you have no power to your motor unless you apply voltage to it and then current flows. So it's just something important to remember. Getting back to my little uh, hose analogy, it's Kirchhoff's first law of current. And this is how we design buildings. It's, it's just, I'm, I'm giving you kind of a little bit tidbits of different things just to help you understand the thought process behind us. And the thing is, is you take a look at a pipe, you have one uh, hose or pipe coming in and you have three splitting out. Well, the sum of the inputs, so whether it's water or current, I is current at this point, is zero. Input equals output in theory, right? I mean, you know, in the electrical world, I'm ignoring, again, the heat and the uh, magnetic field coming out of it. In your pipe world, you're probably getting the water out you're putting in and the same with the air. You know, it's probably not disappearing like electricity kind of does. But anyway, so the point here is that the current splits proportionally to the wire size or the pipe size. So if you have, you know, 100 uh, uh, gallons per minute coming in, this is 50, this is, you know, 30, and this is whatever, they're, they're splitting proportionally. The 50 is getting, you know, more than the others. And that's important. This is how we basically wire buildings. We don't wire buildings in series. We wire them in parallel, which is this. And the reason we wire buildings in parallel, so if anything poops out, it's not going to take something else out. So if you have a motor hanging here, you have a motor hanging here, and you have a motor hanging here, sure, this is going to take all three of them out. But if this one dies, the other two are still going to function. So that's just a basic concept of how we think. So if you want to start like thinking when we get into short circuit, fan wall arrays and that type of thing. One feed versus variable uh, VFDs, like, you know, 10 VFDs versus one VFD. Or maybe you break it, you know, the 10 VFDs into pairs of two VFDs just so you get other failures. So this is stuff you guys kind of know and in, in, in inherently about redundancy and stuff like that. But know how we wire it in a similar manner. So power. The term power means something very specific in the physics world. In our world, the electrical world, we kind of use that interchangeably. We basically say horsepower. Horsepower is power. 
you know, that type of thing. We say one horsepower is 746 watts. That's the, 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 the physical, you know, definition of it. But practically, you probably talk about a thousand VA or something like that. Uh, we're going to talk about the VA and the watts. They're roughly the same, depending how you look at them. We'll get into that in a bit. But basically, there's losses. You know, again, we're, when we talk about the induction machine, the motor, we're talking about there's coils, there's stuff going on. There's losses. Actually, how a motor functions is via those losses, and we'll talk about that. So the British thermal unit. Again, you have a conversion. You have a ton. You have a conversion. You have any of these guys. I mean, I, we generally don't talk about like HVAC systems and joules or calories and stuff like that, but it's there. So as an electrical, when I need stuff from you, you being HVAC folks, there's probably some electrical folks in here. I say, what do you got for me? You say, well, I don't have the horsepower. Well, what do you have? Well, I don't know what I have. Well, I have, you know, the BTUs. Okay, I can work with that. At least it gets me in the neighborhood. It gets me like 90% there. So these are important because on a practical level, electrical engineers can use these to convert and get awfully close. Because, you know, it, the thing is, is that if you're actually picking something, that's great, but that's usually towards the end of a project. If you're thinking about picking something, we have like such thing as like a basis of design, schematics or something do. I need to do something because if somebody's gonna price it, we need to price something. So you can give me something and I can turn that something into a breaker or a panel or a feeder to get priced, especially if it's the big boys. So talking about power, you know, I don't know how many of you have seen the beer thing. That's kind of infamous. Now, it's definitely an electrical thing. I've seen it many times. It's kind of memorable. So we're going we're gonna to pause on this a little bit. The term power, uh, P equals IV, or if we kind of turn it around, VA, the formula is in the unit. It's called a volt ampere. Highly creative, right? What's power? Volts times amps. So we're going to call it a volt ampere. You know, it works. So a VA is basically the full amount of power. So like when a power plant makes power, the generators, they're making VA, they're making the, the full Monty. What we use, if for anything, is working power, it's apparent power, or I mean, it is working power. Sorry, not apparent power of the VA. Working power is what is actually used up by a motor, by a light bulb, by something. Reactive power is losses in the system. This is that, heat and electromagnetic field that comes out of a machine. It basically evaporates. And for all intents and purposes, the heat and magnetic field evaporates. Um, I use the, uh, the, the Predator, remember the Predator movie? You know, the older folks in us from the Predator. What do they do? Go infrared, you know, UV to see different things. Well, if we could actually flip our brains to see electromagnetic field, we'd see a world glowing around us. It doesn't hurt us. It doesn't kill us. Because the thing is, one is mostly the scale is really small, but it actually drops off with an inverse square of the distance. You know, I don't know if the, you, the old folks with CRT monitors, you always say, like, keep three feet away from the monitor. Well, that's because it's glowing with radiation, and it kind of wanted you to not radiate your face off. So they kept you with, with three feet, which gives you the drop off, you know, one ninth of the power at the thing. But, anyways, um, the point is that um, the whole thing is like beer. Now, generally speaking, we're going to make the assumption people don't like foam. You know, some people do like foam. We're just going to make that assumption for now. That real power is like beer. Reactive power is the foam. But the whole thing is the KVA. So that's why I'm saying if VA and W and VAR, uh, there, there's, there's times where they're all like the same, but there's times when they're different as well. So how do we look at this? Now, this is getting a little into the weeds, but I want to talk to you about it because um, this is not really related to HVAC per se but we use the power triangle to talk about efficiencies in the building. And so what we do is we'll often, you know, I've, I've gotten these phone calls like, hey, you know, the utility's penalizing me for bad power factor. Um, why, why are they doing that? And what can we do to fix it? You know, without getting too far in the weeds, there's working power and apparent power and this vertical power is the VARs. And if we talk about, and I didn't get into this, but extra capacitance, extra inductance in the building and that type of thing, the extra capacitance and the inductance swings it up and down. So if we have actually perfect power going into the building, we have a power factor of one or 100%. It's only working power. It's when you add inductive loads and capacitive loads. I'm gonna focus on inductive loads because inductive loads 
are pretty much everything we deal with. It could be light fixtures, it could be computers, and any power supplies. It's especially motors, which is the big deal. Really big motors can possibly add enough inductance to swing the power factor into like low 0.7, 70%, 65, where the utility will get upset and charge you extra for it. So what do we do? VFDs, those types of things, and controls and soft starts. There's different ways to do it. Once you get into like really massive stuff like induction welders and induction furnaces, there's different strategies. But again, I just, your systems as HVAC could possibly be contributing to the owner getting penalized. That's kind of the whole point of this story. Um, so again, getting into the math of it, it's just a triangle. It gets into trig. The angle over here, you take whole side of this angle of this triangle, you're going to get zero to one, zero to a hundred percent. So when I got a phone call, it's like, Hey, my power factor utility says it's below 0.65. It's a real issue. We can actually go look at the meters, start reverse engineering it, finding where the issue is, start adding capacitors. This is getting into the weeds. Inductions are opposite of capacitors. Inductors are opposite of capacitors. Start bringing that power factor down with maybe you treat it at the source, maybe you treat it at the motors, maybe there's other things going on. Maybe there's equipment malfunction. So this is the kind of stuff we look at. And again, resi stuff, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, commercial, 0 0.9. I usually see 0 0.9, 0 0.95. These days, there's really good stuff. We'll see a lot of UW system uh, power plants in buildings with cap banks, capacitor banks, um, but they've since uh, upgraded their chillers and stuff like that. And actually, I've seen some of the cap banks overdrive where they overcorrect, which is actually providing power. Is the, um, the penalty side of this only driven by the mechanical equipment or can it also be driven by the electrical Parts as well. Uh, generally, the electrical parts don't contribute. So they're like, not. There's no load. There's not enough. There's not enough load. Yeah, that's. It's. It's more of a matter of scale. Uh, so if, if you're if you're talking about scale, like industrial facilities, like big art furnaces and stuff like that, that's like the, the elephant in the room. But then when you get into other buildings, it's your motors. Your and it's really large scale motors. Your typical commercial building or uh, you know. Um, lab building, something like that, isn't going to have those gems. So, but yeah, electrical, the, the, the amount of stuff in electrical has gone down significantly. Um, it used to be fluorescent and like bad computers, we had like desktop computers, but past that, it's gotten really slim now to the point where motors are the real problem. And it's not just H, it's usually not HVAC to be honest. So. so any questions on that? That's kind of the intro theory stuff. Okay. So um, the two types of electricity we use is DC and AC, direct current and alternating current. I'm going to briefly touch on direct current. Um, if any of you want to know more about this, I highly recommend looking up the, the feud between Nikola Tesla and Thomas Edison back in the early 1900s. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. We'll get into more of that. Edison was about the DC. He wanted the DC. Tesla was about the AC. Well, we know who won. <laughs> and now he has cars named after him. But anyway, so uh, it was invented in the early 1900s before AC was invented. Um, it did its job. It looks like this. It's a flat. It's either positive 24 volts or negative 24 volts. You guys are very familiar with DC stuff, right? All your controls are all DC. Um, all the, uh, well, the, 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 about it <laughs> for the most part. Controls are DC. We don't use DC for a lot. In the actual electrical distribution world, batteries, flywheels, uh, UPSs, uh, photovoltaics use battery storage. It's very limited. You go into downtown, like urban centers uh, that had DC, so more out east, but Milwaukee has some of this. There's a lot of DC buildings that have components left, like DC elevators and stuff like that. He, uh, he Edison, he lost the battle. I think um, there's other reasons, but on a practical level, AC is just better. DC has uh, expensive distribution, it's hard to distribute, it's high voltage drop. That's primarily the reason that DC was limited to like not the countryside, if you want to call it, the more like cities. It was just hard to get it out of there. It's also very dangerous compared to AC. We talk about AC, that's the kind of, that, that's, the, that's the current that's common throughout the world right now as uh, general distribution. Um, it's a sine wave. It alternates 
from positive to negative. Uh, it's a rotating motor. Well, we're not going to get into the reason of how it's generated, but it's because a, a motor rotates and has different poles, it has goes from positive to negative. Um, in America, in the North America, uh, possibly other places, we have 60 hertz. Um, other places like Europe, I know, has 50 hertz. I'm not sure of the other places. Uh, but the advantages over DC, lower generating cost. I mean, when push games to shove, money won. It's a lower to it's it's easier to generate AC power. We can transform it a lot easier. There were DC transformers, but the AC transformers, I don't know the exact the physics behind it, but they work better and it's just easier to do. Uh, but we get into that, and then we have higher voltages equals smaller cables equals less cost. The transformer, which we'll get into, which is a phenomenon resulting from the induction effect, which we'll talk about, allows this to occur, allows to have, you know. 255,000, and, and we'll get into that, holes. So, distribution system components. This is, the, this is probably the most revolutionary thing that we've had, I don't know, but it's probably a whole lot of other things, but I don't know if we would have a way of life without this discovery, the inductor. The inductor is a device, it's, it's an energy storage device. There's a companion called a capacitor, so inductance, capacitance are opposite and equal reactions. But the inductor, you basically take a piece of metal, iron, generally speaking, you wrap a wire around it, you apply electricity to the wire and out spits a magnetic field. Of course, a little bit of heat, like I said, there's always heat and magnetic field. But in this particular case, if you just run electricity through a wire, just a straight wire, you're gonna get a little magnetic field, but you run it over through this guy, you're gonna get a lot. And you're gonna have, what does this look like? South and North, what does that remind you of? A magnet. It's an electromagnet for all intents and purposes. This is a great invention. What it allows us to do is create at will an electromagnetic field. And that field is proportional to the amount of current and the voltage applied to it. And the turns are important, as we'll see. So this symbol down here, this is the, the transformers, particularly this one, an iron core inductor. We use that, and that's like the half of the transformer symbol that we use. So we talk about electrical machines. Uh, the general term of electrical machines uh, is, is uh, motors and transformers, there's other things as well, that's all we're gonna focus on. But basically the uh, induction uh, phenomenon allows us to create you know, basically motors and alternators. Um, the term rotor and stator, you've heard of those before. The rotor rotates, that's the easy way to remember it. And the stator is static, that's kind of the thing. So the rotor is in the middle and the stator is on the outside because the rotating part for this picture. Uh, if you can't see it online, the middle part is actually rotating. Um, but the basic difference between a motor and an alternator is a motor uses electricity to create mechanical energy and an alternator uses mechanical energy to create electrical energy, right? So a motor is, you, you put it down, hook up wires to it, it spins. You hook up a shaft, hook up to a fan, you get air out of it, right? An alternator, everybody knows an alternator, you have them in your car, little baby ones. But in the commercial world, you take an alternator and you hook it up to an engine. So you take this big diesel or natural gas engine, you start it, what happens? The shaft spins and there's a spinning. You take an alternator, you shove it on it, you hook up wires to it, out spits electricity. Those are the basic two opposite ends of the spectrum. And the induction part plays in, this is a squirrel cage motor. Uh, they call it squirrel cage because that's what squirrel cages used to look like. Evidently. <laughs> I never got that one, but that's what they call it. But anyways, uh, it, you generate a magnetic field here, here, and here, and you pulse it at AC and it goes positive and negative. The field starts fluctuating. And then as it fluctuates, it sequences and spins the the the, 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 the wire the the bars in it so and those those three things on the side of the squirrel cage are inductors those are inductors yes there's coils the, you can kind of see it these are coils like to so imagine those are yep. wrapped like this now this is very diagrammatic there's like different poles and sure. this is not like real it's just a diagram but the concept is this creates a magnetic field and spins it and the other way around is that you'll see in the transformer is that this spins and then it, it creates electricity in the reverse. So let's, let's show that. So transformer, this is, this is the key here. A transformer is two inductors. 
touching through a core, basically. The whole point of it is, is you get a magnetic core, typically iron as laminate and such like that. There's three of them in here, but you take a look at one of them. You take a wire and you wrap around it here. You take a wire and you wrap around it here and you apply current here, a current comes out the other side. That induces a magnetic flux through here. It spins through here and then it, it, it creates a, uh, a current through here. That is a very cool thing if you think about it. So what we're saying is that if you apply electricity to an inductor, you get a field out of it. If you apply a field to a conductor, you get electricity out of it. So those are two opposite things. So we go back to the motor. If we apply electricity through here, we get a field. But if we have a permanent magnet here and we apply a field to this, we'll get electricity out of it. There's your alternator and there's your rotor, basically how these things function. Now, keep in mind, again, these are induction devices. So when we get back to the power factor and the, the, of the building, the power quality of the building, those negatively impact it because it adds inductive load to the building. So it creates wastage. But this is good wastage. It's the wastage to create power. So again, it's this give and take. That we're creating waste. We're dealing with issues in the building. And depending how much waste and what we want to do, if like we get like, you know, like an arc furnace where you stick like a big electrode and you start heating up metal, that's wastage, but it's positive in that we're trying to do something, but it's creating a problem. We just have to correct the problem. So again, that's kind of the, 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 the in a nutshell, what we do as engineers, we solve problems that are created by others. <laughs> so you put the power in one side of the transformer, it creates a magnetic field. Right. And however the size of the inductor is and how much wire is will create the secondary sort of no. Sort of, no yes or no so the ratio of the a turns to the b turns the primary to secondary turns creates that 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 the phenomenon of converting voltage so in in very building basic terms well in basic terms you can do whatever you want with the transformer you can have like you can make whatever you can make you whatever want. you want, yeah. right? I mean, it's it's ultimately customizable. It 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 works. I mean, for my senior design, I designed a transformer for senior design at, at MSOE. It was interesting. We went to Magnetech, had them wire it and cord, and we did experiments and this and that and test it all. It works, you know, it works. So the the thing is, is on the basic on the building side, the voltages we're dealing with are standardized. Why do we standardize anything? just so we can build it in factories and be consistent and have interchangeable parts. The term step up, step down, and then isolation we're gonna talk about. A step up transformer is, you know, for instance, stepping up the voltage 208 to 480, step down is 480 to 208, and isolation could be 208 to 208, 480 to 480. We use isolation transformers to buffer. So the key here, and I want you to remember this part, is that this magnetic field, the amount of magnetic field that core can accept, like, like before it saturates, before it just can't, can't accept anymore, is limited. And so what a transformer is, other than it transforms voltages and such, and of course, you know, generally speaking, transformers have losses. We're talking two and a half, five and a half percent losses of just the core, because by necessity, again, I'm creating waste, but it's to do something. And, you know, you're creating that field to create the other field. To, and then there's waste and there's stuff that evaporates. But again, it's doing something. But that also provides a physical decoupling between this and this. These wires aren't touching. So that's important when we talk about short circuit. It's basically, I don't know what would be, an isolation valve, I, I guess, would be maybe the proper term. And that it can actually decouple short circuit from the primary to secondary sort of like blowing on a pinwheel mm -hmm. right i mean you're not actually moving the pinwheel you're pushing right, right, right across right. the pinwheel right it can only go so fast right right but no i mean blocks. you can you can you know the more i don't want to say you can just infinitely pump voltage at some point it's gonna blow up <laughs> i'm saying under practical measures it acts as a throttle okay so um any questions up to this point lots but yeah keep going <laughs> <laughs> okay so we're going to dive a little into the weeds again. This is kind of like the internal wiring of transformers and such. When we talk about voltages, and this impacts you for like your voltages for your motors and stuff like that. This is the stuff. So we have three phase delta. Now there's a bunch of other voltages. I'm only focusing on the main two. There's other sorts of old legacy voltages and stuff like that. Three phase delta. When we talk about three phase delta, 
we have an A, B, and C phase. Those are, you know, those are the hot phases, that type of thing. That's all we can get. We can get three phase out of it. So um, when we talk about a Y system, we can get three phase out of it, but we can also get um, E, or the voltage, divided by radical three out of it. So in practical terms, if we have a delta system, we have two eight volt. In, if you have a delta system and you have like a panel that's only fed out from a delta system, you can only get two weight out of it. 120 doesn't even exist in that panel. I'll see this a lot in what I call mechanical room panels because the reason being is that, you know, it's just, this is definitely like a 50s, 60s, 70s type of thing. In the 80s, we started getting away from that. But the thing is, is that if you have a mechanical room, what do you have in a mechanical room? You have mechanical stuff. So what are mechanical stuff? Three phase oftentimes, which put three phase motors in. And what I'll see, I'll see big panels with mechanical stuff being a three phase delta panel. And I'll see maybe a little panel in there, which is a Y panel, this delta and Y for the obvious reason, because they're shaped like that. But the whole point of it is when we design electrical distribution systems, my job is to get power where it's needed. And when they, when, you know, so like if you have, Motors, I got to get power to your motors. If you have receptacles, I got to get power to your receptacles. Receptacles are 120 volt. You have to go 120 volt. So in this particular case, you buy a panel board which has A, B, C, and a neutral. And if you go between A and B, B and C, A and B, A and C, and all those, you're going to get two A. You touch the neutral to the receptacle. You know, take the white wire with the black wire to the receptacle, you're going to get one out of it. Kind of magical how that works. But the point is, is that when we're designing things, I always want to think ahead. And this was and that's, and back in the day, I don't say they weren't thinking ahead, but they didn't necessarily need to. I don't know. But they ran three-phase panels only to buildings or to like mechanical rooms. Like we had a project, it was on Waukesha, some school, I can't remember, this was a long time ago. They added a building, it was like, a, like an L-shaped building. They added like a classroom module to the end of it. There's a mechanical room right there. Okay, so I go there, I survey, and I go in. There's, there's a delta panel sitting there, a four inch depth delta panel, some HVAC equipment. They were going to remove some, put some on the roof. It's been modified. And I said, okay, so like we did a, a, a basis of design. I said, okay, we want to put power up here. I said, well, you have to go all the way down to the other side of the L to get the power for that. Like, why? There's a mechanic of the big old panel right there. I said, well, that's a delta panel. And I said, so you have two options. I can't use the delta for the 120 because it doesn't exist. It took a bit of explaining. But you can see, right? It, it was this guy, not this guy. So, okay, great. Well, I said, okay, you have two options. Go back to the main switchboard, which has this, drag a feeder all the way to, you know, up the L to here and pay for that, or we put a transformer in. And he said, well, the transformers are expensive. I said, that's why I pulled the feeder. <laughs> oh, well, why did they put that in there? I said, well, as far as I can tell from what I've seen, you know, this is like 24 year old, <laughs> from what I've seen, <laughs> um, just the way they used to do it is they didn't need it. So they didn't put it in. Right. So it's like, why well, pay for that wire if you don't have to? It's like, oh my gosh. Well, <laughs> in the scheme of things, <laughs> not that big of a deal. But again, so that's the whole, you know, discussion here that you have Delta 208, Delta 480, why 208 120 or why 87. 277 is usually like a lighting voltage, uh, maybe your electric heat and stuff. It's it's a it's a I don't want to say rarer voltage, but it's not used all that much. But that's the story behind this. So when push comes to shove, I put in why stuff. I think most engineers these days just put it why and no pun intended because you never know when you're going to need the neutral. That's the short answer. This is getting really complicated, but you don't have to look at all this if you wanted to talk about phasers and all this kind of stuff. That's fine. Um, the whole point here is this is an internal transformer wiring diagram. So taking this plus, plus this equals this. So we have three coils. So you can see kind of the outline of the cores here, core, core, core. When you put all that together, we have three cores and we attach the ends of it. So we have N, 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 N. We wiring, this is a wiring diagram of one half of the transformer. It's just how we, we take this end to that end to that end and we create a, tri a, a triangle. You you take, this, right? this is just what it looks like in three phases. In three phases. This is A phase, B phase, C phase, core number one, core number two, core number three. This is the delta side. This is the Y side. And so what this shows is that, 
Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So we, we, again, it's chose. I can go Delta, 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 Y, 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 Delta. I can do whatever I want, but the real issue. And when I buy a transformer, this is how we specify transformers. I like said, you want to learn about electricity. This is not HVAC stuff, but when I buy a transformer, I have a decision to make. This is a Delta Y. This is the most common one. I like the Y for the reason I just told you. I like having the Y going wherever. The short reason of they use Delta is because I don't want to pay for the extra neutral on the input. There's no need. It's going from the distribution panel to there. It's a why buy it. You know, just one more thing to buy. So this is the internal wiring. Kind of neat. Kind of like an aha moment in my mind when I first learned about it. So this is, again, the same thing. Delta, Delta, Y, Y, Delta, Y, Y, Delta. Just different versions. And they're not interchangeable. You can't just take a delta Y and wire it as a Y delta. It doesn't work like that. The primary is the primary and the secondary is the secondary. Things don't work like that. There's other things in here called phase shift. And we'll talk a little about the short circuit transmittance and stuff like that. But generally speaking, this is like 99% of what we buy. So I had an engineer designing a project out east and he wanted some fan coils, small motors. He goes, they've all got to be 40 volt three phase. Would that and it's a new building. Would that have anything to do with this? Like uh, you just said I don't have 120. He didn't say why. He probably didn't even know why. Possibly. Hey, well, so the whole thing about 120 is everybody uses 120. If there's one voltage, we are going to use 120 because we have receptacles all over. Right. I, That's why it didn't make any sense to me. I'm like, who's the third horsepower? So you, third horsepower, you want to have 43 phase? Hmm. <laughs> I'll do that fast. <laughs> that's unusual for that small. I would have, I mean, I don't Well, that's know. what I said. I'm like, it's no problem with 120. I'm, I'm sure guessing the distribution wasn't where he needed it to be. Maybe. And you could create it. I mean, you can create anything, everything at the price. No. Okay. Not unsure. I've never heard of a 30 power 43 phase motor. You can only make them to be honest with you. So, okay. Um, well, so moving on to the wiring side of things, we're drawing time. Good. Um, Do you want to take a break at um, like 10 to? Yeah. Stop. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Um, okay. So we kind of talked about this stuff, but the wires have names and they have cones and we talk about them in a certain way. You may have run into some of the stuff. We know what the phase conductors, those are the hots. That's, uh, you know, that's these guys, your A, B, C. We have a neutral conductor. Ultimately, uh, the neutral does go back to a ground. It's called uh, a ground dead conductor. It's not a ground ding conductor. It's very specific NEC terminology, but it is grounded. It's not, it's not a safety ground. The ground is the safety ground, but it is a ground of a form. And, but what its real purpose is to provide a point of reference to create the 120 and the 277. It gives it a zero reference, if you want to call it that. Um, when we talk about the ground conductors, there's a couple of them. The main purpose of the ground conductor, which can be a wire, when I talk about conductors, I usually always specify conductors. But technically speaking, like the conduit can be a ground, uh, like the shell of like a metallic MC clad, metal clad can be, uh, but you know, it, it just, uh, if you get into healthcare and you get in, into, into other things, the healthcare needs redundant grounds. You can use a conduit and a ground conductor. But uh, PVC, you obviously need a ground because PVC is plastic. So there's different, so many permutations. We'll just, for argument's sake, say we're going to have a ground conductor because it's just easier to talk about it. The ground conductor provides basically human safety. Short circuits, this is where we're going to end up with this whole discussion. Short circuits, fault, all those kinds of things happen. Um, electricity is dangerous, you know. I know a lot of you got into discussions, you know, which is more crucial to building plumbing, HVAC, or electrical. I'll say electrical, one, because none of the others would actually work without electricity. But that being said, electricity can and will kill you. I, I, I can't stress it enough. Um, I remember back, we'll talk about arc flash and short circuit, but it's dangerous. It's very, very dangerous. 120, everybody's gotten zapped by 120 at some point, whether being a dumb kid or just by accident, you know, that type of thing. Um, you get over certain voltages. I, gosh, I read a study. It was like over 300 or something like that. And your muscles will lock up and you won't be able to let go. So electricity is very dangerous. So the purpose of the ground wire is to shunt it or get it away from you. You've heard of the path of least resistance. That comes from this, basically. 
Um, the whole purpose of it is to get electricity when something happens to the earth as fast as possible. Then we're gonna talk about tripping circuit breakers and all that kind of stuff, but that's number one. Don't hurt people. And it happens a lot, more than we like, but it still does. We have two different types of grounding conductors, equipment ground conductors. That's the conductor that goes to every piece of equipment. There's a table, there's tables in the NEC and how to size them and blah, 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 it's very prescriptive. But that's the wire that's in everything. Everything is grounded, every light fixture, the building is grounded, every conduit, every motor housing. I mean, the amount of grounding in a building is just astounding. And I, I you like to think it all gets put in, <laughs> but I don't know how anybody could check if it was put in. Or I mean, it's just to be fair, but the point of it is, is an equipment ground conductor that goes through the equipment. You know, it has to do with the size of the circuit breaker. Then we have a grounding electrode conductor. So if you wanna have a delineation, you have a main switchboard. From the switchboard in to all the equipment is the equipment grounding conductor. From the switchboard to the earth, that's the grounding electrode. That's your rebar, that's your ground rods, that's your water pipe, that type of thing. Your lightning rod systems are part of it. Mm -hmm. And all that. So just touching on that very briefly, there's all, I could talk for that for three hours as well. Um, but there's a, there, it's somewhat prescriptive, but it's somewhat of an art form as well. Um, so jumping into the terms wiring, you know, we talk about wires in a very specific manner in electrical. Unfortunately, most people, most manufacturers don't follow that same uh, prescriptive method, so it confuses us sometimes. So um, if, if you find out we're confused on how many wires something has, this is the reason, because we're thinking about it this way, and other people are not thinking about it this way. The wire, when we talk about it, is only the phase conductor and the neutral. The wire is not, the ground wire is not called a wire. It's, again, it's not, we're not talking about the wire, we're talking about wires. So it's just the, the way we do things. So when we talk about three wires, it could be three phases, three neutrals, or three something or other. Ground wire is never part of that equation. And when we talk about perms, we have single phase, which is one phase. We have two phases, which is also single phase. It has to do with some legacy verbiage. Don't call it two phase, at least not the electro engineer. <laughs> um, and then we have three phase. So we have single phase, single phase, and three phase. It's really one phase, two phase, and three phase. So we talk about single phase. This right here is your phase neutral and ground. That's your receptacle wiring. You have your, your little face, right? You have, a, you have a neutral, you have a hot, and you have a ground wire. There's your three wires. We say it's a two-wire system. The ground is not counted. I think primarily the reason we don't count the ground is because it could be conduit. You know what I mean? So we don't count it. Uh, but so when we say two wires, it's that. We could also say this is two wires. This is phase phase. So this is like your 120-volt single phase quarter horsepower motor. This could be like your 208 single phase, three quarter horsepower motor, that type of thing. Still single phase. You've probably run across why you don't read the two phase. You write it with like a two phase. Well, actually you write, no, I'm sorry, you don't. You write single phase. But the thing is, is the reason it's confusing is some people actually come to ground wire. They're like, oh, that's a three wire motor. I'm like, ah, is that two phases and a neutral or three phases? How can it be single phase? Wait, what? Oh, that's the ground. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, our brains kind of click, 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 little steam comes out and we try to compute. And the other one that is confusing when we get to twist lock receptacles, like your uh, passive Seymour and such like that, um, they'll, some, some do it like this, some talk about like the ground wire. So like you'll say like, oh, it's a four wire receptacle. So there's like four pins. And you're like, well, is that phase, phase neutral? Is that phase three neutral? Is that, is that, that's the ground though. Oh, they're counting that. So again, that's, that's the computation that goes through our head. So we talk about now your three phase voltages. We have three phase, 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 phase ground. This is your delta. So we write it sometimes with a little delta there. So that's a phase ground. We have a neutral and then we get a Y into that system. Sometimes I see a Y or W, Y, E, that type of thing. Um, so again, these are your three phase. So phase, 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 neutral ground. That's not a five wire system. That's a four wire system. That's a three wire system. So again, just the nomenclature that we think about just be aware um, if you're if you, if you want to play in that playground, at least understand what playground you're playing in. <laughs> so, can you go back two yeah. slides? Yeah. So, is the reason why the two wire phase phase it's because it's coming from a three phase source? Uh, say that again. This guy? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You you have to have a th well. You can have a single phase source for that, like one twenty two forty. Like this would be your house. Your house might have 240 single phase, two phases, 
an A and a B. If you look at it, you'll see only two pulse circuit breakers in it. Yeah, so it, this can come from a single phase service, or this could be derived from a three phase system as well. That, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Because again, you pull A and B and you- Right, the whole purpose of this is not to actually like do anything. My job is to put it here for everybody else to use. You know, we talk about electrical. I have very little control over my own life. <laughs> very little control. What do I control? I, I know I even control lighting, but that's when I did lighting. <laughs> I had some control. I don't even have control over lighting anymore. I joke when I say 90% of the loads, electrical supplies aren't electrical load. I have no control. You guys are specifying the motors. You guys are specifying everything, you know, that type of thing. I, I get controlled lighting. And really my choice on lighting are 120 or 277, you know, depending on what's available. So we have to populate the world of the building with electricity. And so we're like, okay, there's elevators here. There's rolling doors here. There's HVAC here. And some of them are like, oh, there's a mechanical room. Stick a panel in it. And then we figure out the sizes and such. Sometimes it's not so obvious. We have to make hard choices like that L-shaped thing. Like, what do we do here? Because that proper voltage wasn't there. You know, the other option was like, don't put three phase loads in or, you know, that type of thing. But then they put classrooms in, you need receptacles. So that's, that's the whole trick. So again, the, the, the availability of the voltage in the right place is what we deal with. And then getting down into the weeds of what is specified. So like, you know, often HVAC will they'll ask us, I don't know if you've trained them properly, but <laughs> what voltage do you want? It's like, oh, thanks for asking, 480, <laughs> you know, that type of thing. Or, you know, because if they, as I, I had engineers not, you know, my past life just saying, oh, it's 480. Oh, uh, we don't have 480. Well, why not? I'll allow you, right? <laughs> well, let's change the equipment. Well, you have two options, change the equipment or add a transformer. You know, you're, you're paying the cost one way or another. Uh, and to think of 480 volt. Three phase, third phase, tomorrow motor is not cheap. <laughs> but anyways, um, so that's kind of the, the sort of the theory section, at least of electricity and such. Um, let's go a little bit longer. Are we going to take a break here? No. Okay. Okay. We're getting to a little bit more practical stuff here. Overcurrent protection. A um, lot of words here. These are out of the NEC. <laughs> I, I copied them straight out of the NEC so you can read them at your leisure, sort of. But an overcurrent is something in excess of the rated current, something over what we're expecting, the current. So that's an overcurrent. Could be an overload, could be a short circuit, a ground fault. Overload is like, like um, just something like over the, you know, if you have a 20 amp breaker, 22 amps, 24 amps. Ground fault, short circuit, those are events that are like in the thousands of amps we'll talk about. OCPD, overcurrent protective device. I will be using that term a lot, OCPD. It's a generic term for fuses circuit breakers. It's like, you know, saying car as opposed to like truck or like sedan, that type of thing. So an OCPD um, has a rated current and interrupting rating, a handle rating, if you want to call it that, a fuse. A current limiting OCPD also limits current mm -hmm. through it from short circuit events or fault events. So if you have a handle, uh, a, like a 20 amp breaker, it'll limit it to 20 amps. It'll act a certain way, we'll see. But in addition, a current limiting device does above an extra to limit current, short circuit current going through it specifically. So the um, OCPDs, they're designed to automatically open and automatically open, manually close, but they're designed to interrupt these events that occur. When things abnormal occur in systems, they're designed to interrupt them. It's a safety mechanism. Uh, we talked about the ground. That's when a, when a short occurs to the ground, something goes to the ground, the breaker ahead of it should trip in theory, that type of thing. Um, so we're getting into current curves here. This Now we're getting into the short circuit world. So the anatomy of a current curve, the time current curve, it's called time current. It's time is up here and current is here. It's a logarithmic 10 scale. So it gets up really quickly and the time grows really quickly. So like this is, I can't read that. I think that's like a second. That's 10 seconds. That's 100 seconds. That's 1,000 seconds and blah, blah, blah. And then same with amps. You know, it grows really quickly. Like over here is in the thousands of amps. But the whole point of this guy is, is it maps out the function of an overcurrent device relative to the load. This is a tool we electrical engineers look at 
to map out short circuit studies and stuff, which we'll get into in a bit. The key point here is this is a long time trip right here. When we say a long time, it's like over 10 seconds or, or five seconds. It's a little, a little fuzzy. I mean, I'm sure there's a definition somewhere. I just kind of call it the top. But basically, it's a long time trip. The infinite time up here is the handle rating of the circuit breaker. So if it's a 20 amp circuit breaker, that's 20 amps. If it's a 100 amp circuit, that's 100 amps. But you can see it gets greater and greater over here. And then it gets greater and greater over here. So this is short time right here, this one. This is the ground fault. Well, it's something you may or may not have ground fault, but that's where the ground fault curve lives. This is the short time trip and this is the instantaneous. This instantaneous is the, the short circuit. This is your 10,000, 20,000, 50,000 amps. That's where this lives. This is in between. So the shape of the curve is important on this because it has a time delay component. So like, for instance, when a motor starts, everything starts at zero, if a motor goes you know, up and then settles down, you have a little bit of room for that inrush to grow. Or when a transformer surges, or an MRI takes a picture, or a CT scanner does this thing. There's, there's a lot of equipment that have inrush and surges. Um, so that's, what, that's the purpose of the curves. We'll get a little bit more into it. But what's a fuse? A fuse is the simplest OCPD we have. Um, it's simply a piece of metal dipped in sand. That's really what it boils down to. The metal actually um, melts um, when the current exceeds it and the sand turns into glass or something equivalent to glass to quench the arc. That's, that's a simple device. So what's the whole point? The point is, is a very simple device. It's a very hardy device. It can last a long time. It doesn't really degrade. Um, the outside may as well, but the inside generally won't. Um, I mean, you can probably have fuses around for 20, 25 years that are still working just fine. Um, it kills itself. It's self, you know, it, it blows itself up. It melts itself. So once it melts, it's done. You have to replace it. You know, as opposed to like a circuit breaker, which trips and reset it. Uh, the characteristics really don't change over time. Um, basically, there's two types of fuses, fast acting and time delay fuse. A fast acting fuse is on a left. It's basically a line. So like if you have a motor, you may have a motor bump into it, an inrush bump into it. So what time delay fuses do is they have another physical mechanism inside, little springs that melt and such. They add, I call it the knee. So the knee allows a motor to get a little bit more room to do that. So you may have uh, bumping inrush problems where the inrush would trip the fuse out. So we have to be careful on that. So time delay versus non-time delay. Now the fast acting is key here because these are typically your current limiting fuses as well. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about that. So again, what are the advantages and disadvantages of fuses? They're foolproof, they're kind of dummy proof. They make the socket so you can't really interchange them. So you like there's like families of fuses. So you can't actually take like, you know, like a 30 amp fuse and put in like a 100 amp fuse socket and vice versa. I mean, <clears throat> where there's a will, there's a way, but you're not supposed to. <laughs> So um, the disadvantages are, you know, they are fast acting, uh, but there's three of them. There's one per phase. You blow one of them, you're going to be single phasing something. And motors don't like single phasing, you know, so you take one phase out of a motor. It doesn't necessarily like that. You have to replace the fuses. You have to store them. You have to have somewhere to store them. There's a lot of maintenance involved, you know. If, you know, if, if Bob the janitor knows how to replace the fuses and stuff, and the fuse blows at this wing of the hospital at, you know, two in the morning and bleary-eyed Bob has to go do it and dig through the, the um, you know, the closet to get the fuses. He's going to pick the right fuse, you know, that type of thing. I, I use that example somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but the point is, is that if you look at the fuses on the types of fuses, the amperages of fuses, you could have, like, an entire storage closet full of fuses and still not have enough fuses. You know, it's, it's an amazing amount of fuses, how they build up with all the different types and sizes. Uh, and again, they're non-renewable, so you have to buy new ones. Eh, okay, I guess. But they're really good. I'm going to talk about the current limiting aspects of fuses. This is kind of meat and potatoes type stuff right here as part of short circuit. This curve is much different than this. This is your time current curve, your, your pretty generic curve that we use. This is not. This is amps versus amps. It's basically uh, the, I call it the starting short circuit, the short circuit that is calculated per, called perspective. This is the short circuit that we care about. This is the let through in amps. So the, how you read this, it is the up over down method. So simply put, 
like if you look at this blue line, it's 65,000 amps. I just showed 65,000. You go, this is a Eaton class J fuse. You go up, call it 60 amps. I just showed 60 amps. Go over and down. It limits to 2,100 amps. So 2.1 K in terms of we see. We have come 65 K to 2.1 K. It works. It does that. The key here is that it only does it for the device that's in it um, without testing. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, if we go to 30,000, it limits it to 8,300. So, you know, if we have a 400 amp fuse, so if I have this red 5K line, the 5K line is important. How many people have run across your 5,000 amp space? Talk to your electrical engineer and said, wow, we can't have 5,000, we need something. And you end up with a 65,000 VFD, right? That type of thing. That's a common thing. Um, you know, the 65 is gonna limit it to 2,100 under five, great. The 30 isn't, it's not even gonna to get to under. So yeah, not always I don't get this. So 65,000. Right here, you have start 65, take it up to your fuse curve, 60, 100, 200, whatever fuse you're using. Yep. Hit it, go over to this angle B and go down. And the angle B is what? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's, it's the, it's the um, peak let through amps for a non-current limited fuse. If you map out the amount, like the time and the current that it lets through, that's what this line is. So that's like the normal it's operation. Tested. It's the normal tested. operation is twenty. Normal operation as long as you're tested. below twenty one hundred. Yep. Okay. Got yeah. it. So in this case, you go up. So like if you didn't have this current limiting fuse, this extra stuff in the fuse, it would just act like this. So sixty five. Well, if it went up, so it called thirty would possibly you know would allow you to peak at. It, would, it wouldn't do anything. Why would 30,000 allow 8,300? It seems counterintuitive. Because it doesn't current limit. That's the short answer. It doesn't limit. It, you're not supposed to use a graph like that. Okay. It's, it's for the current limiting. But it's a, this is all tested data. It's, it's not, you know, it's, it's how, it's how they, you all, it's part of the UL listing. But anyway, so the point of it is, is that we can do things, but depending on the amp size of the fuse, and the current inputting and that type of thing, it's not always the magic bullet. Yeah, it's going up to 400. 65 yeah, limits 2100. 30 if you follow the 80. 60 amp curve, it would, curve, it would be. Incredible. Right, I got it. Right, so it's not the magic bullet all the time. There's different fuses and everything, but it has to do with, we'll talk about the UL testing and such as well. I just wanted to touch on that before we dive deeper down the rabbit hole. So a circuit breaker, again, is designed to open and close by non automatic means and open uh, automatically as well. So you can open and close it like a switch and open automatically without damage to itself. Fair enough. So circuit breakers, you know, there's, you can read this yourself, but there's basically a shell, there's a switch, there's markings, there's dials, there's arc quenchers, there's contacts, there's all these mechanisms inside. Point is, it's a very complicated device compared to a fuse. There's a lot of stuff to break, you know, a lot more stuff to break than a fuse. Uh, we talk about the trip unit. Uh, why don't we take a break? We're at time. All right, sounds good. We'll be back. <clears throat> it's uh, 11. How about we come back? Well, wait at 11.10. All right. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Thank really you. Back to the Okay, I'm talking to them after this. Yeah. Okay, so in, uh, in a circuit breaker, like, like a fuse is is what it is, a piece of metal engineer hits the amps balance, basically. Uh, circuit breaker, we need a little bit of brains. Um, we talk about the trip unit here. Uh, the, so we talk about the long time phase to phase ground, phase to ground, you know, thermal overload, short circuit ground, followed the long time, mm -hmm. trip time, short, that type of thing. All that stuff basically is embedded in the trip unit, or we'll call it the intelligence. Um, there's electromechanical versions and there's digital versions. Um, the thermal, the thermal magnetic circuit breaker, you've heard the term, is basically in somewhat ingenious electromagnetic device, um, has two main components. This is the long time trip thermal, and this is the magnetic, which is the short time instantaneous trip. Um, the basically thermal is a piece of metal. It's a bind metal, not unlike your heaters and your starters. It bends, it just kind of goes, whoop, and then as it as a current increases the heat, then it just trips the handle. Pure simple, like really ingenious, hardy, pretty, pretty heavy duty. This right here, this little coil guy, there's a piece of metal through there, look familiar? That's an induction unit. That's your instantaneous. What happens is on a short circuit event, the current jumps so high, 
it creates a magnetic field through there. It blows it open via magnetism. So what does that look like as far as the trip curve? We have the thermal long portion. We have the magnetic short portion over here. Note it has a foot. This is instantaneous over here. Um, and we have a very, it has a width, which is, I guess, the, like the fudge in the materials, you know, plus or minus that falls within there. We'll talk about the tripping. Um, it gets a little fuzzy down here because you're kind of literally getting down to the molecular level. And we're not exactly sure what goes on. So they, they just kind of, we're, we're kind of good up here. We get to really short, short time period, like, you know, 0 0.01 seconds. We're mostly sure that's what happens is my understanding. Sure, the, the breaker dies will buzz. Oh, yeah, we know exactly. I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> that's why the foot just kind of had a continuation on it. Anyways, but point being, uh, this one that I showed you, which is a great graphic, uh, I think it's from whatever circuit breaker I pulled over. Um, it had the long time, short time. That's this guy. It has the dials and such. So, um, and if you can imagine, you can move this guy this way, you can take this guy, move this way and this way and this way. That's all the dials. You just push and pull and tug. Literally in the programs we use, you grab them and you move them. <laughs> Is it one of those things where you go, God, I hope the guys who are setting the system up actually did adjust yep. the dials? Yep, and that's part of our punch list. We go, hey, we just had a project. We're walking through, we're like, huh, everything is set to one. That's not possible. <laughs> so, you know, in the old days, the whole, because again, if you take a look at a motor, a motor will go, woo. And then it'll settle down. Your inrush bulge bumper will be around here. In the old days, before we had current, we actually like tried to predict this stuff. Again, try to predict this key. They would start the motor trip, start the motor trip, to, you know, just it's like motor starts, great, we're good. Eh, I mean, it's a way to do it, but it's kind of, sorry, kind of little trial and error. We try to do better. We try to give the settings. But to you can't even. Folks. You don't always have the right voltage at the motor anyways, which will change when things trip, right? Again, it's within reason. We try to, you know, we try to get with it. It's not a science. I mean, it's kind of a science. It's mostly science. We try our best. Um, circuit breakers, uh, advantages, it's a switch. It doesn't break like normally. I mean, I know normal operations that open and close, open and close. You know, the test on 10,000, 20,000 operations, you'll, you'll test, they'll just, you know, have a robot, you know, beating on them, telling how it breaks, part of the UL listing and all that. Uh, disadvantages, uh, periodic maintenance is required. You know, you have to exercise them. There's, there's, there, the, most of them aren't maintainable. The big boys are maintainable, they're really expensive. These, the molded case, the little ones, there's oils and stuff. You have to turn them off, you have to flick them, get the oils moving, the juices moving. Um, because they like everything, they harden in place. We had we we did a um, a uh, facility assessment uh, for it was a factory and walked in and uh, talked to facilities guys with some old circuit breakers said oh you know checklist age of transport said when's the last time you exercise these circuit breakers oh I don't know I've been here for thirty years we never turned them off you know they may not turn off. And if they turn off, they're probably not turning back on, <laughs> you know, because the metal gets hardened. You know, it, it, the coils, there's, there's springs, there's oil, there's it dumps up, you know, you have to lubricate it. And, you know, for the closed circuit one, you can't, it, it, it changes with age. So they're expensive. They're great. We use circuit breakers for everything because you don't have to stock fuses. But again, it's the pros and the cons. Um, there are current limiting circuit breakers. Uh, they're very rare, at least I don't see them a lot. Um, the curve is a very different curve, you just go up and over. Um, in this particular case, again, I made 5,000 in the red. And in this case, the dashed red is like a 65K. It goes, it'll curl in it to, I don't know, 18 or something like that. Um, I drew the blue in, the 10, it'll limit it to 11, which means it's not limiting, right? If you're Having 10 is limiting to 11, you're letting the full 10 through. So again, the, like the fuse, you have to use the right curve. It may or may not current limit. It has to actually be engineered and chosen by an engineer, which is the key point, is if, uh, if you're going to put the current limiting, current limiting capabilities inside of something, either somebody has to take responsibility for it. If the engineer is going to use it, the engineer needs to see the curve. If the manufacturer is just gonna say, I'm providing you with a current limiting curve, it's likely going to be taken responsibility by the manufacturer as part of a UL listing, which is the key point. There's a big deal in that. So if, you know, if you're saying, hey, I put a current limiting fuse in, it should limit it. And I go, great. 
I'm not stamping that unless you actually prove it to me and show me a UL listing for it, that type of thing. So just taking an overview, breaker versus curves, similar, different, kind of the same thing. They often end up in the same, I mean, the graph, when you graph these guys, they have to live in the same graph and they bump into each other a lot. Key point here is this one doesn't really show that foot. That foot often goes way out there and will bump into fuses. So um, when we talk about uh, sizing, this is just some informational stuff. Um, we size motors, uh, non-motors of transformers with a 25% buffer. That's all we do. Um, and the main reason is this terminology called continuous versus non-continuous. The National Electrical Code defines continuous load as something running for three hours or more. And if something is running for three hours or more, it simply heats up. And all they're doing is they're simply saying, add 25% or remove 20%, you know, multiply the breaker by 0.8 or the, or the load by 1.25, you know, the inverse is 1.25. Um, just to get that heating load, that bump. So generically, we just say 20 amp breakers are worth only 16 amps, you know, that type of thing. We only load them with 16 amps because sometimes we don't know the load or how it operates. You know, can you tell me your motor is going to operate for three hours or not? Positively, no. So I'm just going to assume it's three hours at a time, you know, that type of thing. And that's what just keeps it safe. Does that matter if you're using, like, if your piece of equipment that you're sizing has a soft start VFD no. electronically? It's always the, you always oversize it anyway. Well, yes, for general equipment. So general, I'm saying non-motors here. Oh, non-motors, right. like just stuff like okay. washers, dryers, lights, whatever stuff. That's that's how we do that. For, uh, the the twenty percent rating. Um, so looking at motors, um, again, you could take this and you know flip it. Motor sure. curve is it's, it's different from the time current curve. At least the axis is flipped, but it starts you know six to eight, six to ten times in rush. That's your across the line in rush. Typical your VFDs. Or soft start. So a VFD is a soft start as far as the starting is concerned. Then has the VFD stuff after that. Two, two, two point five, maybe three times. So you get less inrush from a soft start. Or whatever. Um, there's different ones. This is historical full voltage auto transformer Y delta part winding. Um, we still do full voltages for stuff, but these guys are like mechanical starters. I don't see them anymore. Uh, fire pumps. I might see part winding. I don't see any of the stuff in elect and, and mechanical stuff anymore. I'll see solid state, which is your non VFD electronic start. And then your VFD electronic start will have a solid state starting with VFDs after that. So that's why you're talking. It says two to five in here, but I usually see two to three hundred percent or times two to three times. So what that means is that when we talk about motor sizing, we um, want to have the code says a maximum circuit breaker size is 2.5 times the full load amps. There is the fuse is 1.75. There's no minimum, but the minimum is can you start the motor? It's to not trip the circuit breaker. And what that does is if you take a look at this, this is 1.25 times the full load amps. This is 2.5. That's just nodding to the inrush that we acknowledge the inrush will be more and we're going to allow you have a bigger circuit breaker to not trip it. Now, you can, if you have an electronic circuit breaker, uh, you can play games with like adjusting the short time to adjust for the trip, but then bring in a long time. You can play games. That's, that's really getting into the weeds. But again, the basics. Two and a half. Two and a half gets you where the foot of that curve. Isn't bonking into the isn't, curve. Got it. Yeah, that's the basic. We're trying system. to cut it yeah. in half. And again, if so this is like, um, the 2.5, in my opinion, is like across the line. If you have a 2.5 VFD, I can tighten that down. But just in the, the give and take is the more, more room you give it, the less you're going to run into with tripping problems, but the less protection you're going to theoretically have. The tightening and tighter you're going to do, you'll have more protection, but you might bonk into it. And you got to buy bigger equipment and you got to buy thicker wire. Right. right. All that jazz. So, so there's that give and take. And here's what they made. So we're a little bit behind <laughs> intermission. Not surprising. Yeah. Anyway, so, um, okay. So that's kind of setting the stage for this next discussion. Okay. So we've talked about the magnetic fields. We've talked about transformers, decoupling transformers, circuit breakers, the curves, time current curves. Now we put this all together and design something, right? Um, looking at large scale power distribution, we have generating stations, we have switch yards, we have transmission substations. We get to substations like by the side of the highway. We get to like industrial, like our area right here. We go to commercial areas. We get residential. 
Um, the key point is there's transformers all the way through this, stepping up and stepping down. That was, that was the whole point of this slide. Um, if we look at a building on the building scale, the purpose, the reason I pretty much have a job is to get power where it needs to go. If you want to boil down the entire existence of a building engineer, electrical engineer, is to get the power that everybody needs, who everybody, where they need it in a building. So that's the whole key. So we take a look at a one-line diagram. You guys have seen this. Uh, there's different versions called riser diagrams. This is a, a one-line because each of these lines are one line, but it really represents, if you, if you, could, if you could read the test, it's like three number 12s, you know, that type of thing. It's one line, just for clarity. Riser diagram goes up and it's more physical. This is no, there's no physical component. Like you look at this and you go, like, I don't know where it is in the building. So you look at a riser, it's like four, one. To low. What's that? High voltage to low voltage. Yeah, yeah. The high voltage to low voltage. This is the flow of electricity in a one line. It goes down. In a riser, it goes up. And in the riser, you'll see floors, like first floor, second floor, and like locate stuff. This isn't the case here. Um, it's just two different methods. So what we're going to do, we use, uh, right, we use one line diagrams. So utility transformer, meter, main switchboard, panel, 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 like 40 volt panels, lighting, small motor loads, big motor loads, two rooftop units. Uh, TVSS, short circuit, uh, SPD surge protection device, another panel board, generator, transfer switch, little panel board here, two transformers going down to two weight lows, distributed to, well, it's not a real building, I made this up, but you can imagine this is like, you know, like a wing, a floor of offices, uh, healthcare, you know, whatever you want to do. But the point is, is electricity flows down, that type of thing. We'll talk about the shorts, the shorts, the, the tripping goes up and the short circuit goes down. We'll talk about that in a bit. So terminology, again, there's a lot to go here, but on the NEC side, there's a short circuit. It's an abnormal connection uh, that occurs um, between two or more points of potential. So face to phase, you know, zap, boom, type of thing. Um, a fault current is the resulting current from it. So short circuit is the event, the fault current is resulting, and the short circuit current rating is the rating that's applied to the equipment. So it's three different kind of things we talk about. When we talk about faults or shorts, there's a bunch of different kinds. The worst case is a three-phase bolted fault. That's where all three phases touch each other. Extremely rare, I call it extremely rare in nature. <laughs> it's usually a startup issue is what happens. Uh, because the thing is, even if you say like you have a three-phase circuit and a backhoe hits it, the chances of all three wirings touching, maybe like through the back hole shovel, it's actually rare, you know, and then they're going to blow itself apart. When we say bolted, it's kind of like holding and placing and letting it sizzle and letting it cook. So when we say three phase bolted fault, think of like a piece of switch gear. We have like three big bus bars. And it's, I, this is mostly where I see it. They have like shipping uh, struts and they'll put like a piece of copper and bolt all three together. So they're not bouncing around during shipping. Sometimes you forget to take those off and turn it on. That's a three-phase bolted fault. That's like, you know, 1,200 amps touching all three of them. Like the biggest explosion you could possibly get for that switch gear. That's what we calculate. Most things are line to line, line to ground. You know, um, honestly, most of them are like light two mixtures shorting out or 120 volts or like a computer power supply and stuff like that. And so when we talk about the different faults and stuff, we do the worst case and that's what we have to talk about. So your 22K or 65K, that's a three phase bolted fault. That's what we have to calculate too. When we look at the one line diagram and a short circuit occurs, first off, we never know when and we never know where. I know like insurance has like the whole act of God clause type of thing, kind of sort of like that. We just have to prepare for everything possible. We never know when or where, what magnitude, what's going to short. So we try to plan for everything. Do we? I will officially say, yes, we plan for everything. But the reality is we all do our best for every scenario that could possibly occur. So um, short circuits. So if we have a fault right here in this panel, what happens is that like a downed power line, power just flows unimpeded. I mean, just like, just the spigot is open power just flows from the utility down, it will damage and blow up and just melt and do everything along the way. At a certain point, utility's like, okay, we're done. The utility does monitor system. They'll see an abnormality. There's closers on the line and stuff. We don't take any of that into account, but the utility will protect itself. 
So what does that leave us? We have to protect ourselves in the building as best as we can. The fault will occur right here. So what that's saying is that when it flows unimpeded for a time frame, that everything along that path has to withstand it. It can't blow up. You can't be like, it just, you, we don't design buildings to do that. So we, 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 we try to determine what the energy release at every point is and then tell you, this is 22, this is 15. Our panel boards have to, everything has to happen. So that's what a short has to occur. The path. Everything on that black line has got to be. Everything on that black line. That. Right. So whatever I calculate right here and right here and right there and right there, and it gets larger the closer you get and it drops down because of voltage drop, basically. Half so it could be like 10K, 20K, 35K, 45K, 50K. It has to withstand and it has to just ride that through until it's cleared. What is the clearing? A device popping somewhere. So what do we do? We take a look at everything and it's required by the NEC. Don't need to go through this. We have to do this. The NEC forces us to do that. So what do we do? We take a look. And then so in, in as far as the short circuit study is concerned, the circuit breakers don't matter because they're closed when this event occurs. When it first starts, it occurs. And you're talking like in maybe like half a second event here. So we're talking like really short term. We take a look at the feeder length the available short circuit, the, the utility will give us the available short circuit set. We're going to allow you to have 45,000 amps before we're cutting you off. And we go, okay, we're going to start with 45,000 amps. And then we just simply do a voltage drop calculation through every branch of the system. We used to do it by hand. Wow. Okay. I lived through that. Not good. Thank God for computers. <laughs> uh, but it's a simulation. We basically input just varying parameters, all the wires and everything. So, and the thing is, is the, the, the key here is that motors actually contribute to the short circuit. So if you get 45,000 from the utility, motors will add to it. And the reason being is motors are spinning for that really short time frame where the event is occurring and the breakers trip, the momentum of the motors, the physical momentum turns them into generators. They actually contribute electricity. There's no difference between a motor and a generator. What's the difference between motor and alternator? Providing electricity or spinning via mechanical energy, right? There's no difference. It's just in reverse. So for a very short period of time, they provide that. So again, we want to do the study to, to have the correct sizing at every point along the so way. So the motor spinning faster is increasing the size of the magnetic field? Uh, no, it's just simply the, 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 the electrical energy spinning the motor cuts off. Okay. And then the field is... the the the. the it depends on the make of the motor. It could be a permanent magnet or not. But it, generally speaking, we say it provides. It's it's. I mean, it's a tiny schnibble. Okay. Even the big motors are tiny compared to the utility. Okay. But you do some big stuff. It has to get. It might be like, oh, we're gonna add another thousand. It's not not a lot. So, so generally speaking, so we model this. This is like an output. This is SKM. Um, but anyway, so you take a look at this. So like here, this motor is you know twenty two thousand or twenty. Actually, uh, can't read that. I think 22 is a big one, maybe 25, I don't know, whatever. The numbers are in there. But uh, point being is the range is anywhere from, I don't know, zero to 200. You see 65K a lot. Um, generally speaking, uh, because uh, 480 and 208 are inverse sort of, you know, like amps and, amps and voltage are inverse. So 208 systems will have drastically higher AIC ratings than 480, um, but then you're, you know, you have less capabilities and that type of thing. Most 480 are under 65 and most 208 are under 100. And just generically speaking, what I've seen, you know, that type of thing. You know, if you have 208 at 75, 80, is not uncommon, that type of thing. So that's the result. So we do this for everything. And so like you can see, like there's amps along, this is a wire, every, every point. We just, it, it runs it. It's, it's quite complex. So um, again, each piece of equipment has to be able to withstand, interrupt. There's different things depending on what device is it static is it a breaker is it a motor is it whatever but point being it's a certain amount of time and that certain amount of time goes back to these guys because nothing is instantaneous right these guys there's a time period for this trip the time period so if we're living in the short circuit down here or down here there's a like point one as it ramps up it goes Boom, there's a lag. It could be half of a second. It could be a tenth of a second. That time over, that, that time with the amount of energy 
uh, the time with the amperage and the magnitude of the amperage creates the amount of energy. If you want to get into engineering terms, you integrate underneath the curve. And then you get the amount of energy that could be released. So that, that's getting into the arc flash side, which we haven't quite gotten to yet. But that's the whole point of it. So um, each piece of equipment has to be rated for it. Has to be rated. Now, the key point is, and we run into the ASJs who force this on us, is that the code has clarified um, it, it, that it does not include the actual piece of equipment. So if you think of it, there's a starter feeding a motor. If the short occurs in the motor, the motor can't have withstand because then it, it's, it's blowing itself up. It's the source of the issue. So everything upstream of the device control is has to be rated. The nuance, but it's an important nuance. So <clears throat> that's a short circuit study. So we look at the whole spiel, get the AIC, get all the wires, we map it all out, run the calc, we get amps and go, great. And this is where we get the, hey, I need 22K for this unit and everything. So at, at Ring and Do, what we've started to do is put the SCCR ratings in the mechanical schedules, but it's fed by the electricals so that we can buy that properly, okay? Coordination study. In simple terms, we want the device upstream of the fault to trip. We have a fault, we want him to trip. Why? Just limits the amount of stuff shutting down, right? Just limits the amount of stuff shutting down. He fails, I want him to trip. He fails, I want him to trip, dot, 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 dot. So you don't want like your light fixture ballast taking out the main of a hospital. That's the basic point of this whole thing, that type of thing. So what do we do? We take a look at this and go, okay, we map all of the devices. So here we have main breaker, distribution breaker, main breaker, distribution breaker, fault, or if it's down here, maybe a little breaker, that type of thing. We take a look at all of those. And this gets very busy, but just look at the concept of it versus the thing. We layer all those. So if we go from left to right, we go from small to large. Left is little guy. And we go, dot, 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 dot. The, if, if you go from zero time, zero amps to time and amps, the load does this, right? The load does this. Every time the, the load or the short circuit or whatever you want to call it, the amps hit a curve, it should trip that curve. Uh, we have a question in the chat yeah. uh, from Kelvin. He said, can you talk about how to estimate required short circuit current ratings of equipment control panels before the coordination study is completed in the early design phases? Uh, yes, I'm going to get into industrial control panels in a bit. I have a little bit of a code on that. Okay. Um, so um, the, yeah, so the current will hit these. So if he doesn't trip, he should trip, he should trip, he should trip. And so on a very basic level, they need to not touch. They need to have daylight or some gap between them. And so we layer that. And then so if we pump, we take, so this, this again is getting very, very tedious. We used to do this with like mylar overlays. We, you know, all these breaks, we follow this path. And we, we plop them all on the graph and then we adjust them just so that they do it. And then all of the adjustments, um, those current settings and the dial adjustments and that type of thing. And so we have to, we, we, we want to do it for everything, but we have to do it for the emergency branches and that type of thing. Um, so, but we want to do it for everything. And the reason we want to do it for everything is because there's an order of things. The short circuit, count that we have to. We do the coordination study sometimes because we have to for like the article 700 or healthcare 517s and that type of thing. But we have to do arc flash. We have to provide arc flash labels. So therefore, we have to do a coordination study, at least do the coordination study. And not everything on a normal side or optional side has to coordinate, but we have to run through the study to get the settings to get to here. Because again, if you take that time and the trip and you take the incident energy, that leads into arc flash. And what arc flash is basically, it identifies the available incident energy for you know based on nfpa 70e so that we can create labels and the whole purpose of these labels is to give boundaries restricted boundaries that type of thing if you look at these labels you've seen those all around and you'll see things like what do you wear and so the whole purpose of this is that it provides electrical workers guidelines when working on equipment what to wear what are the boundaries what safety precautions to take that type of thing because like i said arc flash incidents, short circuits, faults, they're not preventable. 
what we can do is we can try to predict them, but they're not necessarily preventable. Maintenance can do that, everything, but things still happen. You know, there's some videos I've had from like mining accidents and stuff. It gets nasty. Guys getting heart flashes, their ears puffing up like cauliflower, melting skin, all kinds of stuff. What did the guy do? He didn't even do anything. The door opened, fell off, hit a bus. How do you predict a door falling off, you know, by accident? It's just things happen. Would maintenance have solved that if they saw the maintenance guy loading and saw the engines rusting? Maybe. But again, so what is the proper thing to do? One, don't work on things live. Two, protect yourself as an, as an electrical contractor. You know, there's certifications and stuff. So like this one, long sleeve shirt, pants, coveralls, face shields, balaclava, you know, the hoodie, hard hat, safety glasses, things like don't wear polyester. Because when you hit an art, wear cotton, hit an art flash, the polyester will melt your skin, that type of stuff. It gets really nasty, but it does occur. That's not a real person. That's a dummy. <laughs> that's a testing thing. But anyways, what do you get? You get arc. You get electrical uh, light. You get heat. You get molten metal flying, as well as concussion, compression. You, you know, cave your chest and break bones, that type of stuff. It's really nasty stuff. Severe burns, eye loss, that type of thing. NFPA talks about all that stuff, about the fireball and all that stuff. It gives the guidelines. So it's in the code. We have to do short circuit. We have to do arc flash. You have to do some coordination study, but to get the arc flash, you have to do the full study of all the settings. And then, so it's kind of like, while we're at it, let's just do the best we can to coordinate this stuff. We don't have to coordinate for code. That makes sense, hopefully. So that's the system studies, okay? Applications of it. Um, industrial control panels. So we take a look at the industrial control panels here. Um, without reading this, pretty much anything is an industrial control panel. Now, the, the term industrial is per NFPA 101 is defined as it's in a facility that basically is manufactured, creates something. There's a definition, whatever. I've had HJs poke at me that anything's an industrial control panel. And, you know, that gets fun. <laughs> but um, the thing is, if you look at any components, push buttons, lights, anything can be an industrial control panel. So the short circuit rating, so here's this. The short circuit rating shall not be installed where the available fault current exceeds it. So we're basically saying an industrial control panel has to meet the AIC rating of where it's at. So I run the calculation. I say there's a machine over here. There's, a, there's something in a, a, like a, a press or whatever. I can actually, to, so to, to the online question, I via the short circuit study, I can actually... Um, account and say that's 22k at that. So that's how we do that it's via the short circuit studies. Many short circuit studies don't go that deep. They stop at panel boards, but we would take it further all the way down to the equipment to predict what the AIC rating is at that point. At that point, it is up to the manufacturer or whoever's making the control panel to provide the right components. There's a lot of white papers out there. I've read white papers on Eaton and Little Fuse and stuff like that. And all the components within there have to be rated for that short circuit rating as well. So if it's a custom industrial control panel, there's a lot that has to go on to verify all the various components have the proper ratings and such. If it's a UL listed system that just is tested and this and that, you just go buy it. That's probably the best case scenario. Um, the markings are a big thing too. Um, I had a client who had, a, uh, had uh, short circuits uh, flagged by the inspector. There's no marking and stuff. Well, the equipment was from like 1910 and half of it was like German, that type of thing. So what do we have to do? We actually couldn't get any UL listing. I mean, we didn't even know where the manufacturer was, much as testing, because it has to have the rating of the listed assembly on it and established using the approved method. So there's UL listing, or um, this is getting to the weeds that I'm not familiar about, but I'm assuming shops often have UL listing to build stuff a certain way and some UL listings would apply to build with this and just make sure the components are proper. That, that's how I understand industrial control panels to, to work, the, the concept of it. Um, SCCR markings for everything else. Well, everything has to have an AIC or AMS interrupting or SCCR rating to match. So whatever we come up with in the study, uh, your 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, whatever we come up with, Everything along that line has to have that. Does it? That's a different question. Motors and circuit controllers have to have it. AC refrigeration, elevators, and industrial machinery. This is the, the industrial machinery, but 409 falls in that as well. 
these guys have the extra markings that are required. So when we say extra markings, it often has to have a nameplate, the UL testing uh, somewhere inside of it, outside of it. I kind of did the dot, 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 interior, exterior, there's a whole bunch of language. But that's the marking and the testing laboratories. Uh, just could be UL, could be ETL, could be uh, European, CA, Canadian. Uh, the code doesn't really make it like UL. It just has to be a nationally recognized testing laboratory. Um, but these are the guys that have it. I'm sure there's more. I didn't really dig through that any suit too much, but I found those. So what does that mean? Pretty much everything is an industrial control panel. There's obviously, again, industrial control panels in industrial facilities. I'm trying to play for, oh, this is an industrial control panel, not in an industrial facility. I've tried to be like, well, this is an industrial. Uh, again, AHJs being AHJs, sometimes they flag it, and sometimes we're successful, sometimes we're not. Um, but everything for the NEC is required to be listed, and it has to have the AIC ratings. Um, we have to have it tested. Unmarked equipment defaults to this. Um, I have a little blow up of this guy, but this is UL 508A, SB 4.1 Supplementary Bulletin. It actually has assumed maximum short circuit ratings for unmarked components. So when there's no testing, no testing to be done, like the old German equipment, no testing that could be done. You know, I don't think you all would want to come in and test something from 1904, you know, if, if you even wanted to. Um, it defaults to this. And what's this? From a motor standpoint, five, 5,000 amps is what it defaults to. Um, after 50 horsepower, you get a little reprieve. You get 10 after 50 horsepower. Um, I mean, you can go up and up, but I rarely see anything over 201. That's not an industrial facility. So what does that mean? You know, I go to Home Depot and I pick up a $300 load center to shove in my garage. It's 10,000 amps. I go buy a $15 circuit breaker at Home Depot. It's 10,000 amps. Why? Because it's tested to be 10,000 amps. There's a UL listing. Is your equipment 5,000 amps by default? I will guarantee your equipment is not 5,000 amps. But like Schrodinger's cat, right? Is the cat in the box if you don't look at it? Unless you test it, it's 5,000. The inspectors will not accept anything past that. So I have to deal with that. You know, and what do manufacturers give us? Well, sometimes no choices. You know, I, I'm, I'm speaking from electrical from what I see. You guys probably know better. But from what I can tell, you either get no testing or 65K. That's what it seems to me, right? I would say probably 70 to 80% of AIC or SCCR ratings I see. I bet 22 would do the job for most of them. But does anybody test a 22 or 30 or 42? Or and I'm saying those numbers because those are standard electrical distribution numbers. No. Well, what's involved with the testing? You up money, right? Money. Are you going to test every piece of equipment? I mean, as an electrical, I'd love to just say, here's my list, do it. But it doesn't actually work like that all the time. Wouldn't you figure that, okay, so you're going to buy something and it's going to have a motor on it yeah wouldn't you think that the motor would have the ccr rating because that's the drive well, again the motor itself if is creating the fault so it can't withstand itself it's like it's like the motor is creating the fault it doesn't withstand itself i mean it may survive but that's not how the ratings work it's uh, upstream the motor is the, the short-circuited device right so we, we look at the controller Again, I know this is industrial, but again, I've gotten flagged for non-industrial facilities. You look at this, two or more components of overload relays, fuses, disconnect switches, circuit breakers, or push buttons, lights, selector switches, timers, or combination. You take two of these, it's an industrial control panel in an industrial facility. Again, maybe it's an industrial, maybe it's not, but point being, any starter, I mean, heck, a light switch with a pilot light could be considered a control panel. Now, at some point, what we're really talking about from a solution standpoint is to fully rate everything. I know that's not possible. It adds cost. It adds uh, UL testing. Um, can it even survive? You know, like that German equipment. Okay, great. Let's go pay UL $15,000 to rate it. Oh God, it's only worth five. We could have just not paid the 15 and just ended up at five anyways. You know, that type of thing. You know, one version, if, if I'm solving the problem, okay, I find all the AIC ratings, I keep on saying AIC, AMPS interrupting is a circuit breaker rating. It's the same as SCCR basically. 
if I'm finding all the SCCRs, I'm telling you I need this, this, and this, and you just say, I'm not doing anything. I have solutions. I have solutions for all of this. What's one solution? Voltage drop, right? Because my short circuit calculation is basically a voltage drop simulation. When you get right down to it, I start at 40,000. I get down to here. I put in all the wires and I say, okay, that's 8,000. Okay, that's voltage drop. What do I do? Make the wire longer. Which wire do I make longer? Probably the smallest wire, because the, if you make the, the smallest wire in the system will provide the most attenuation of the short circuit, just mathematics. You, you don't want to make the big pipe bigger because you radius wide, you know, the whole pizza equation, you know, <laughs> what's, how much uh, more pizza do you get out of 12 inch versus 10 inch kind of thing. So we make the smaller ones longer, so we increase voltage up. What does that do? You're increasing the conduit and the wire costs and the hanging and the labor and our hangers and all that stuff. Where do you put it? <laughs> That's a bigger issue. So, so for this one factory, that was like, okay. And I was, I, we, we were brought in as a consultant for this factory for the German stuff. The inspector flagged them and said, that stuff needs to have a, a good rating. And they said, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to make the wire long as one solution. It's like, well, where do you put it? You know, how much money are we spending to wreck the wire around the building a couple of times? Like all of them. That's kind of dumb. So we didn't do that. But it adds extra capacitance where you put it. It's possible at Ring and Do. This is my schedule. I came up with a schedule that I'm starting to use. It's a minimum wire size to attain 5,000K. So in this case, I have, I look at the panel upstream 10. If I have a 15 amp circuit and I have number 12 conductors, the minimum conductor length is 20 feet. Not that hard. You usually get 20 feet from a panel board. What if I have a piece of equipment right next to there? I go, oh, well, then I have to, I have to increase it. So I put a, is it, is it a dumb solution? I don't know. I tend to think it kind of is. Does it work? On paper, it works. Is it practical? I don't know about that. But again, I have one for 10K, 12K, 15K, 80 I all the way to 65K. And it usually ends up being the big motors that are hanging directly off the switchboards because the switchboards are closest to the service. They see the largest AIC rating. So you can kind of focus, you know, the eye of Mordor on some of the things. But, <laughs> but the other way to do it is an isolation transformer. Remember, I was talking about the inductor, creating the core, creating the delinking. You can actually, in the saturation of the magnetic flux in the core, you can actually use that as a pressure valve in, in systems, basically, mm -hmm. to basically delink the source and whatever. And we get we call it like an infinite bus calculation. So basically, on this one, I use 2.5% impedance of the transfer, which is actually really low, very efficient, but it actually creates a very high uh, short circuit, not getting onto the weeds. But the point is, is that you can see where they're under 5,000. Not all of them do that. So what do we do? So that solution for that one German equipment factory was to buy a bunch of little isolation transformers. They deemed that was a cheaper version to do that. Well, you say, well, why did we talk about the short circuit when terms of like the wire getting longer and isolation? Let's just drop a, a current limiting fuse in, right? Just drop a current limiting fuse and a disconnect switch right above it. Right, great, we got the 2100. You know what the inspector said? Show me the testing. Show me that you are listing that that piece of equipment is rated to use with that particular fuse. Oh. And we went, <laughs> wow, uh, okay. Uh, isolation transformers, that is. <laughs> right. So is the current limiting fuse the magic bullet? Can be. Generally speaking, the advice that I can officially give is that it has to, it can be used it wants to be part of a UL tested or a manufactured tested system. Um, we can't just stick current limiting fuses in. On paper, it looks like that, but there's, there's things where if they have uh, like relays or circuit breakers, which are blown open, which change the impedance downstream, it changes the load profile. It can't give an effective, reliable solution. That's what the manufacturers say. Some say that, some don't. But there's a general consensus among everybody that you can use these, but it has to be part of a UL at the solution. And so the kicker here is, is that if you have AIC ratings, you have to test for a range of AIC ratings. You know, you got nothing, which ends up being five. We got 65, which you know a lot of people do. 
I, I would probably say like, let's get something in the middle because I think you can probably get something in the middle, but somebody has to pay for that. It has to be across the lines. You know, do you stick a current limiting fuse in the, in the motor controller that's on the unit? Yeah, you could, that would be great. That'd be work great, but it has to be UL listed. It has to be tested. And so do you test it for, you know, families of fuses? There's class J fuse from Busman, Little Fuse, Merce, and that type of thing. Are they the same? Are they not the same? I would say a class J fuse is a class J fuse, but what does UL say? Does it say, is it a class J Busman fuse that's tested or just a class J fuse? I don't know. That's some weeds that I'm not privy to. But again, what I keep on getting again and again and again, testing, UL, testing, labeling, testing, testing. That's what I get again and again. What's the solution to this? Do you feel like the inspectors understand this well enough to be good enforcement agents? Or is it just that's a catch all? I do. Yeah. I do. I, I, you know, just like everybody, when we deal with AHJs, there's varying types of AHJs. And if you're doing residential versus commercial stuff like that, um, I think it's an education thing because I don't think it's a one size fits all. Like, you know, I've, I've had, you know, a couple, couple, couple rings or a couple rounds in the ring arguing over, is this an industrial facility? It's not an industrial facility. You look at UL 101. Well, it's not UL. Well, it's part of NFPA. I mean, or NFPA 101. Like, and NFPA 70 is the NEC. You know, it's still part of NFPA. Well, that's it. All right. It's tough. It, it's tough. I mean, is the easy solution just give me a piece of equipment and rate it? Yeah, it's the easy solution. But it's not always the right solution. Right. Elevators, for instance. Um, it, I'm trying to keep it more generic. We've had elevator manufacturers say, you know, we can spec, can spec 65 or 22 KAIC elevators to look blue in the face. Some of them are like, yeah, you're getting 5K and that's it. That is an, and that's, it's not an industrial control panel, but it was in the list of, like, if you go to elevator, dumb waiters list, whatever that section is, that verbiage for the AIC, SCCR and the labeling is exactly the same as an industrial control panel. So it is. And that's a very, I mean, you have you ever seen an elevator controller? They're super complicated. They're like really crazy. Yeah, that falls under there. They're not doing it. So then what do I do? Do I wrap the circuit around the block a couple of times for the elevator? Uh, we put in isolation transformers for elevators. Just, you know, and they're not that big. I mean, you know, maybe we can get away with a 45 KVA and end up at a, you know, over here. I mean, 75 KVA is 3000. That's a pretty big, you know, if you, if you want to just equate this to horsepower, 75 KVA is roughly 75 horsepower, just approximate. So you can, you can, you can dump in a 75 horsepower motor with an isolation transformer but what's that 75 going to cost you? It's going to be five, seven grand for the transformer at all in 12, 15 grand, well, you know? So I, I don't have any magic solutions. I just want to kind of tell you, this is where we're at. The magic solution is everybody just do their job and give me AIC ratings, SCCR ratings, but I know that's not realistic. So we do have tools in our toolbox. They're awfully expensive. They're, they're big tools. You know, you get a transformer, where do you, a 70 K, 75 kVA transformer, that's not a little transformer. Where do you put it? Heat gate. Oh, I need exhaust for this room. You know, all the kind of fun stuff. You know, it's complex, expensive, all this type of stuff. You know, more maintenance. It's a collaborative effort. You know, I, I, I think what it boils down to is I've learned uh, in the field is knowledge of the SCCR ratings is, you know, 90% of the battle. Um, keeping control of shop drawings. I hate to say that as an engineer, that's the thing, you know, um, and as manufacturers, I, I think we all can do better. Engineers have to give the knowledge out. I think manufacturers have to flex, give into the testing because the issue is not going away and it's only getting worse. You know, regardless of whether I'm going to battle, whether it's an industrial control panel or not, that has nothing to do with it. The fact is the, we were only fighting about the old German equipment and the nameplate of it. It has to have this SCCR. This is on every job now? Every job. Every job. Every job, no matter how little. So if you do a design, you figure it all out, assuming that you don't have the rating from the manufacturers. Uh, good question. You know. As best as we know, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I would say we go in, at least on the HVAC schedule, putting the SCCR ratings in uh, that we know of, you know, and like if we put... 18, 20, 25, we're, you know, the, our HVAC specs at 65. 
Um, you know, I'd like to get a little bit closer, but I kind of think manufacturers don't have a little, the smaller versions of it. You know, like elevators, now I'm kind of like going in, making the assumption now that I know what I know, elevators aren't going to, so we're going to drop an isolation transformer. So there's a very amount of methods, but... I'm just thinking if I'm a mechanical contractor throwing a, a new rooftop on a job and I'm going to get inspected, do I need to worry about this? Mm -hmm. You know, there's a tree fall in the forest type of thing, right? Right. Well, oh, is anybody you, looking at the AC rating? Does anybody know? You know, you take like it depends on your inspector. Yeah. Show me your receipt. show me the paperwork. Yep. We've gotten that. We've gotten calls from contractors saying, "Hey, I have a problem," and I say, Ugh. "Well, here's some of the solutions." Like, "Well, it's really expensive," and it's like, "Yeah, I know," but you don't know. You know, the, this this method right here, this output SCCR. That's the maximum, no matter what the input is, that's the maximum. So I can guarantee you, if you drop a 75 kVA transformer in, you will, at 2.5% impedance, which could vary, you will not get more than 3,600. I can guarantee that. And we're looking at 65,000. Yep. So we're, with this method, we're not even close. Yeah, to you're not using isolation. Well, you could. I mean, they're probably, you know, 90 inches tall, you know. Six feet wide, <laughs> we could. No, the, 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 the technology exists. It's okay it's, to be below it. It's okay to be below it. Yeah. The technology exists. The solutions exist. It's just money. So, you know, and then, you know, you got a little bit, like three minutes. There are devices, and they're really expensive, and they do exist, to actually kick down the short circuit at the service. That's another way to do it. So instead of starting at 40000 you put a big old $20,000, $50,000 device in at the service, kick it down to twenty. Then you're like, hey, everything's 10, great. Uh -huh. you know, so you're taking care of the root of the problem versus dealing with some of the symptoms of the problem. But then it would take out the whole building, right, or whatever. Right. Well, it, 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 well, yeah, it could take out the whole building. And again, the faster the device, the more current limiting, the more possible false tripping you might have. So it's this give and take of protection, like like sizing motor in rush. You want a smaller breaker, you want a closer, or you push it further out, it may not trip when it's needed to trip. And the thing is, is that all of this, the overview is that when you push and pull and tug all the curves and everything, all the incident energy changes up and down and that type of thing. And I know like a lot of facilities just say, we we're our flash labeling everything, but we don't care. We're not working on anything live. Not moot, moot point. Never working. Right, okay. How do you say that in a data center? How do you say that in a hospital? How do you say that in a bank? You know. So there are occupancies where you cannot do that, or do you build in redundancy? Do you? We've already rented temporary generators to be able to take. You know, getting down into the weeds again. There are solutions to all this, but it costs money, and it all phasing and planning and. This, that, and the other thing. So, well, so great. That's it. Any questions online, Sienna? Um, that one. Okay. So, any questions here or any questions online? Now would be a great time for them. Just give it a second. Yeah. When you say that this is required on any job, is that retrofits and new buildings or just yeah, new buildings? Yeah. Um, for remodels, generally speaking, it applies to the remodeled equipment. So if we're adding a, a piece of equipment to an existing panel board, we calculate out the AIC ratings. And this is kind of splitting hairs, but if the panel board is inadequate, one, we'll notify the owner, just due diligence. But two, probably put the right rate of breaker in knowing the panel isn't right. You know, so like if we have a 10K panel, it's like, oh, we calc that out that 15K. Well, we'll put a 18K breaker in, but the panel still is not 15K. It's legal. Is it right? That's subjective. Um, I would say the right thing to do would probably gut the whole building and fix it all. But again, reality needs to be taken into account. So we do the best we can. Yeah. Sure. You want to intro the next class for next one? Uh, the next one? Yeah. Okay. Well, how about a nice hand for our presenter? Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.
Oh, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. You'll learn something. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we ask you back next year if you're willing to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, take it away, Caleb. All right, everybody, thanks for coming. Great group um, this month. Uh, looking forward to next month's training. Um, if you're not aware, uh, Price Industries has a sub-brand called Antec Controls. They make venturi valves and high accuracy terminals and lab controls and fume hood controls and all that. So they're going to come in and talk about critical room air control and all of their offerings. So um, I think it's a really great offering. I really um, think it's easy to use. It's also compatible with other controls. So I'm really looking forward to that and hope that you'll all be at that training as well. All right. Thanks, Caleb. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thanks See you all next time for those online. <laughs>